Right. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Uh, I'm delighted and honored as always to have uh, Brian McVeigh back. And today he's going to be talking about Japan. He spent 17 plus years, something like that in Japan. He's written several books about it. And I am, I'm very eager to learn about this culture. Uh, one thing I'm going to say is that East and West are very different from each other up to a point where one doesn't really grasp the other. Uh, and if they think they grasp it, they grasp it at a very superficial level. So we are living in a global world where the connection between the East and the West is far more closer than ever before. And it's going to become closer and closer. So we better understand the East. And so I'm really delighted to have Brian here. Brian, please take away. Okay, uh, well, thank you uh, for having me again, and thank you everybody for coming today. So just let me give some background on what my relationship to Japan is. I originally went over as a student, and then I was offered a job there. I spent about 16, 17 years there. I taught about, I, I taught courses on Japan uh, when I came back to the U.S., but maybe about uh, seven or eight years ago, I changed careers. I, I left uh, higher academics. So I haven't really been uh, teaching about Japan. In fact, I haven't really been thinking too much about Japan. I have published a bit on Japan the past uh, seven or eight years. But in any case, what I'm going to do today- I, 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 just, want to, I just want to say, uh, that's actually a very good thing. Because many times what happens is that when you are involved in something for a long period of time, you get into the rut, you, you, you get into certain patterns. So having all that experience with actually living in Japan, studying Japan, talking about Japan, and then having a complete break from it, and then coming back is actually probably the best context. So go ahead, go ahead, Brian. Right, actually, I think you're right. I think that's a good point. And I think that applies to uh, anything. So when I used to teach uh, courses on Japan, the first thing I would do with the students is go through a list of what we might call myths and misunderstandings about Japan, sort of assumptions that at least Americans make. I think people from other countries maybe have a different view of Japan. But from my experience, uh, especially young people, uh, they, they, um, they've been fed certain images of Japan. And with me, when I was young growing up, Basically, I only had uh, two master images of Japan, we might say. One was World War II, lots of movies uh, about Japan, uh, fighting against Japan, of course, uh, dropping nuclear bombs on Japan, winning the war against Japan, occupying Japan for seven years by the U.S. forces. And then uh, the other image is that Japan is a great economic power. So that's what I uh, was brought up on. But I noticed younger people these days, uh, and I think in general, the American population, they have other images of Japan, that Japan is a powerhouse for pop culture. And that, you know, didn't really exist back in the 1970s and uh, 80s, at least in the United States. It really wasn't until the late 80s, maybe the 90s, that we started to have new uh, images of Japan introduced into the American landscape. And of course, people are much more familiar with Japan uh, because of uh, globalization and much better communication. People travel to Japan. When I first went to Japan, it was, I think for many people, a bit unusual uh, to go to Japan. Now it's not that unusual uh, at all. So let me begin, as I said, by talking about um, some, what I call myths about uh, Japan. And some of these things, I think people might sort of roll their eyes at because they may say sound commonsensical. These are things that you that people probably know if you're well read and traveled. But like I said, um, I still hear these myths, and I think these misunderstandings about Japan still float around. And uh, I think, given the uh, climate in America right now. Uh, with uh, discussions about racism and anti-racism and things that have happened to uh, Asian Americans and other people of color. I think this is a very pertinent uh, discussion uh, because it shows us the power of not really taking seriously uh, other people, no matter where they're from, whether they're American citizens or 
uh, their ancestry is different from ours or they're from different parts of the world. So the first myth about Japan has to do with the size of Japan. And there's this idea, uh, again, not among everybody, but for some people, that Japan is a small island country. And Japan certainly looks small compared to the United States on a map. It looks small compared to China on a map. But Japan is not a small country at all, geographically. It's, it's a pretty big country. Um, it's probably mid-range in terms of uh, size. It's, uh, geographically, it's bigger than many European countries. So that's one thing uh, to, uh, to take into account, especially when it, because this relates to um, what type of natural resources Japan has. And of course that relates to uh, its economy. So in any case, that's the first point I'd like to make that geographically, Japan is a big country. Uh, the second point, and this relates to this notion that Japan is small, that Japan uh, being a geographically small country does not have a lot of people. But actually Japan, it years ago, I think was ranked uh, number seven in terms of population. Now I think it's number 11 in terms of population. Uh, that's not a small country. So that's the first thing we have to keep in mind. And of course, be, given Japan's uh, population size, this uh, explains why, well, it's one of the reasons, not the only reason, but certainly it's related to, to Japan's um, uh, economic, economic prowess. So the second myth that I'd like to talk about, and I think this is a very important one, this idea that Japan is racially and ethnically a homogenous nation that there's something called the Japanese race. And that, uh, and, 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 and this, th this idea sort of uh, explains why Japanese are the same when it comes to language, traditions, or customs. Well, of course, there's a lot of ways to attack this myth, this myth of Japanese homogeneity. Uh, Japan as a nation, uh, like any nation given its size, is very diverse. It's very rich in diversity. And, uh, and in, in any case, this idea of race, I mean, that's a very questionable scientific notion to begin with, that, that we can neatly divide the human species into different races. Um, so if you look at Japan, there's actually tremendous uh, linguistic diversity in terms of dialects, regional customs vary tremendously. There's a great urban rural uh, divide in Japan. Of course, there are huge generational differences as there are in any society. Uh, I mean, basically what I'm trying to say is Japanese do not think alike. And of course, why would they? Uh, but again, this is a powerful myth. And I think maybe this myth has been e eroded a bit the, the last 20 years or so, but certainly uh, when I was in Japan working, when I used to teach about Japan, this was something I would come up against many, uh, many times, this idea that there's, that Japan is special because it's uh, homogenous. Japan has many, what we can call subcultures. Uh, and these have to, if you really want to understand Japan, uh, you really have to come to terms uh, with these uh, different uh, subcultures. One of the, one of the ideas uh, related to this notion that Japan is homogenous is that all Japanese or most Japanese are middle class. And, and, and you know, that simply isn't true. Uh, but again, there's this idea that Japanese somehow share this sameness. And just let me uh, inject this important point because what I'm gonna, about to say really relates to everything I'm talking about today. When we hear these myths and these misunderstandings, the first thing we should do, as I used to tell students, is we have to ask, why do these myths exist? Who is propagating them? Where do they come from? How long have these myths been, along, been around? So for example, this idea that Japan is homogenous, ethnically and racially. The interesting thing is, before 1945, that was not the official ideology of the Japanese state because before 1945, of course, Japan was an empire. And the very definition of an empire is diversity. 
that you have different peoples that the emperor or empress rules over. And so before 1945, uh, Japan was a, a, a major colonial power and it colonized, as we know, uh, parts of uh, China, all of Korea, and uh, eventually uh, of the other parts of, uh, of Southeast Asia. So the, the, the whole idea, as far as the Japanese rulers were concerned, is that Japan is not homogenous as a political entity, as an empire. The, the, the official teaching is that we are all brothers. Of course, you know, we don't have to go into uh, uh, how the Japanese actually treated their brothers uh, in the empire. You know, they, they, of course, treated the Koreans and the Chinese and other Asians uh, very horribly. But at least so at a superficial level, the idea is that Japan was not homogenous before 1945. It was quite racially and ethnically diverse. So where did this idea come from then that Japan is homogenous? This actually was a post-war invention by the Japanese state and intellectuals, uh, this idea that, look, we lost the war. We have to change what it means to be Japanese. Let's regroup, let's rethink things, and let's, let's push this idea that uh, we never really had an empire, perhaps, which of course sounds bizarre, but in a way, that's what I think the rulers are trying to do. And there are very practical reasons for that, because at that time, after 1945, you had many Asians, many imperial subjects living in Japan, Koreans and Chinese. And the idea is, well, what do we do with these people? Because these, not everyone wanted to return to Korea or China because they had already um, established lives in Japan. They had fam families in Japan. And so one of the reasons why they came up with this homogenous idea, I think, was to um, deny rights to Chinese and Koreans who were uh, still living in Japan after Japan's defeat in 1945. And in fact, that issue still is around, right? In, in Japan, there are uh, sizable uh, Korean Chinese uh, minorities. Uh, the Koreans uh, in Japan typically are divided between uh, support for either North or South Korea. And besides other Asians, you also have indigenous uh, people living in Japan, for example, the Ainu and other uh, what we might call tribal peoples that we don't hear much about anymore. So in any case, the point here is that there's that Japan has a history of, uh, of diversity that's uh, quite complex. One other point I, I want to make on this idea that Japan is a homogenous nation is in the modern world, to put it simply, there are basically three types of identity just for the sake of argument. One is your race, which as I said before, is really not a scientific concept, but unfortunately it um, sort of shapes media discussions and media perceptions of who people are, uh, I think especially in the United States. Uh, the, the other uh, type of identity is ethnocultural. Uh, and then the third type of basic identity is your citizenship. And so I bring this up because when I used to teach you know, students, you know, th th there was this sort of a uh, confusion or conflation if someone, if they would say, well, that person is Japanese. Well, what, what do you mean by that exactly? Are you talking about their citizenship? Are you talking about this idea of race, you know, just physical appearance? Or are you talking about ethnicity or ethnocultural? Those are three very, very different things. And of course, that point that I just make, that I just made applies not just to uh, Japan, it applies to all modern societies. And so uh, we have to, of course, keep that in mind. I mean, it sounds like, like a simple point, but if you pay attention to the media, for example, in the United States, how are groups represented? Are they represented as being um, from different cultures? Are they represented as being from subcultures? Are they represented as being citizens? Americans. So, for example, uh, when I hear the term uh, in, in this country, oh, well, that person is Asian. Well, of course, there are many types of Asian ethno cultures in the United States, right? You're talking about um, someone from Korea, from Southeast Asia, Vietnam, from China, a different part of China, 
you, you know, what, what type of Asian identity are you talking about? And then are you talking about an American citizen? And if you are, I don't want to be too politically correct, but you should be using the term Asian American, not Asian, right? So this discussion that we're having today about Japan actually has, uh, I think, a universal um, application and has practical uh, implications for how we uh, relate to each other. So the so just to recap uh, what I've said so far, because I think it's important, this idea, this myth that Japan is a homogenous nation, that everyone shares the sameness. So as I said, Japan does have uh, minorities. Um, Japan, not all Japanese are middle class, if you look at things from an economic uh, perspective. And this idea of the myth of homogeneity is a post-war political uh, invention. Rel related to this idea is this notion that Japan has a unique culture. Well, of course, I mean, that, that myth is very easy to deal with because you could say that about any society, any group of people, that they're unique. But this was something that I would hear from a lot of uh, non-Japanese uh, I, when I lived in Japan, I would also hear it from many Japanese, uh, certain Japanese politicians would push this idea that there's something uniquely unique about Japan. And uh, as I said, that's not really, I think, a, a helpful way to begin a discussion if we're serious about trying to understand uh, another culture, because of course, all cultures are unique. You can't say that one culture is more unique than the other. Um, and then this idea related to Japan's uniqueness, that there's something exotic about Japan. Um, again, that's really in the eye of the beholder. It depends who, who, you're, uh, who you're talking to, I suppose. But what I noticed in Japan among the Japanese elites uh, quite often was this attempt to exoticize Japan. Well, this, like all myths, again, we have to ask, why is that myth being thrown out there? It's being thrown out there for, uh, for, for a good reason. I mean, some people have an economic agenda, they have a political agenda. So for example, it sounds funny today to say it, but back in the 80s, uh, there were a lot of trade disputes between, the, between Washington and Tokyo. And the Japanese delegation would argue that, well, we, cannot Im we can't import American beef uh, because Japanese intestines are shorter uh, than Americans and we can't digest beef. I, I know that sounds uh, silly, but th these are the types of strange myths that driven by economic interests would be put out there. Or that Japanese, we can't import, I don't know, uh, French skis because Japanese snow is different. There's something unique about Japanese snow. So in any case, again, to make the connection, I'm pointing out these myths and these misunderstandings we have to ask where they came from, why are they still sustained, and uh, what are the political economic reasons uh, for these myths? And, th and there's nothing special about Japan doing this, right? Uh, but there's nothing special about the Japanese government. All powers, all national states put out their own myths, right? So in my case, my citizenship, actually I have dual citizenship, American and Irish, but you know, for me, I hear myths about Americans every day, that Americans are very independent, at least compared to other societies. Well, I, I could give you so many examples where I just don't see that. I don't think that's the case. So I want to be very clear. Um, I'm not beating up on Japan. I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to sound like I'm being overly critical of Japan. Myth-making and creating misunderstandings is something that happens everywhere. And I think to be a good citizen of the world, to be globally aware, we have to pay attention uh, to these things. Another myth that I used to hear a lot, um, I used to get this from uh, Japanese students and I'm gonna cut them some slack because of course they were very young and maybe they hadn't taken enough classes yet at their university, but this idea that Japan is somehow an inherently peaceful country. Um, well, it's true since 1945, uh, Japan has not, um, has not gone to war, which is different from most other countries, probably. But uh, certainly before 1945, Japan was not peaceful. 
And again, there's nothing special about Japan. Uh, many national states uh, inflicted violence on uh, other countries. But still, the, the idea here is that there's nothing unique or special about Japan if you look objectively at its history. Related to this idea, and, and this is something that I think uh, maybe more people uh, can relate to, uh, is that Japan does not have a military. They have something, something like a military. Maybe it's a paramilitary, a police force or something. They call it the self-defense force. Well, the, the self-defense force is a military. Uh, and, you know, of course, we can ask, do the Japanese have the right as a modern national state to have their own military? Um, wherever you come down on that debate, of course, that's one thing. But the, but the, 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 the objective truth is that Japan does have a military. Not only does it have a military, it has one of the best armed, well-equipped militaries in the world. Again, I'm not making any judgments. There's nothing wrong with that. But let's look at uh, the facts. Um, and also this idea that Japan has not been involved uh, in any issues or disputes since 1945. Again, that's very questionable because the, the Japanese military uh, was part of the uh, uh, American military project in that part of the world uh, to keep uh, Chinese communism and Russian communism at bay up until the, uh, certainly case of Russia up until around 1990. So uh, the, the Japanese, of course, uh, did not uh, send troops to fight America's wars in Asia, in Vietnam or Korea. But nevertheless, Japan was very supportive of the American military uh, agenda in that part of the world. And again, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. I'm just saying that uh, we have to look at the, the facts in order to dispel some of these myths that we often hear about uh, Japan. Um, let me go back to another myth, uh, this idea that the Japanese language, th this relates to this idea that Japanese culture is unique and special, that there's no other culture that you can compare it to. Another uh, myth related to that is this idea that the ja Japanese language is very unique, that it's unrelated to uh, any other language. And I haven't studied uh, Korean formally, but if you look at, if you compare Korean to Japanese, actually they're, they're quite similar. And of course, a real linguist is able to trace the, the roots of the Japanese language. There is nothing unique about the Japanese language. Um, uh, another myth that um, I actually had a lot of experience with is this idea that the, the Japanese education system is superior. Well, again, you know, it depends what you're looking at. Um, certainly, if you look at the Japanese higher education system, it's actually riddled with uh, severe problems, at least compared to the American education system. Not that it's perfect in America, but uh, the idea here is that there are many Japanese uh, who are very critical of their own education system. And there's a lot I, I could say about that, but I just throw that out there as an example, because that's something that when I worked in Japan, I would hear that often, not so much from Japanese, because the Japanese, of course, had their own children in their own education system. They had a pretty good idea what the pros and cons, what the strengths and weaknesses were of their own education system. I would get this, this I, I would hear this a lot from Americans, especially Americans visiting Japan, especially from American researchers coming over to Japan to study what was so special? What was so? Uh, uh, why why was the Japanese education system so effective? And they they to my mind at that time uh, when I was living in Japan, it seemed that they were falling into this trap of a, of believing the propaganda put out by the Ministry of Education uh, and, uh, about how good their education system was. Um, so in any case, I've written uh, three books on Japanese higher education. Uh, based on my experiences working there. Um, and so it, that for me, it was sort of a, 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 personal, a personal issue when I would uh, constantly be being told how good the Japanese ed education system is. It really depends on what part of the system you're comparing. Uh, I mean, you could make the argument that perhaps in some ways at, at the lower levels of the Japanese education system, kindergarten, primary school, they do um, a good job in certain things 
but after that, by the time you get junior high, high school, especially by the time you get to university, they actually have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, serious problems. So uh, one other thing maybe I'll say about um, th this idea that th about uh, a sort of misunderstanding about Japan, where does, where does Japan come from historically as a country? And of course, many people uh, and again, maybe things have improved the past 10, 20 years, I don't know, but many times uh, people would say, well, the two countries that have mostly influenced modern Japan, of course, were China. And of course, that goes back uh, a thousand, almost 1500 years, um, uh, how China influenced Japan. And then the other country, of course, is United States. Uh, especially because after 1945, after the war, uh, the United States uh, occupied and tried to reform uh, Japan. Uh, but it, again, if you're, if you're careful with your history, the countries that have really influenced modern Japan are European countries, especially Germany. And I'm talking about what happened in 1868 um, that was the year of what they call the, the Meiji Restoration in Japan. And for the next three or four decades, beginning around uh, 1870, the Japanese went on a crash course of modernization. And of course, there was some influence from the Americans. But when it came to reconfiguring their economic political institutions, uh, to my mind, uh, it was the, the, the Europeans, the French, but especially uh, the Germans who really, um, uh, who, who were paid attention to the Japanese when they tried to catch up, when they tried to modernize. And that's, that's actually a, a key point to keep in mind um, about Japan. And this applies not just to Japan, it applies to many countries around the world. When you look at the past 100 or 200 years, to put things very simply, you can say that there are two types of countries or two, type of, two types of societies. Some societies try to modernize and they were successful. Most countries try to modernize and they were not successful. And we've never heard from them again, very, very sad. Japan is an interesting place. And I think the reason why we have a lot of, uh, maybe some of us have strange ideas, a lot of misunderstandings of, about Japan. Japan is one of the few countries outside of the European Atlantic uh, sphere that successfully modernized since the late 1800s. It was a very bloody modernization because of course we know that the Japanese tried to emulate uh, the Europeans by building an empire uh, beginning in the late 1800s. And of course um, the, 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 the upshot is that Japan was uh, crushed in, in 1945 and had to rebuild. But um, we have to keep in mind that uh, by the time the Japanese were beginning to what they thought do the modern thing, which at that time was to have an empire in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Western empires and empire-like uh, societies such as the United States, which officially was not an empire, uh, but certainly acted like an empire in different parts of the world, uh, the, 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 the Japanese, in a sense, were behind the times because by around 1900 to early 1900s, you had a lot of nationalist movements in the places that had been colonized by the Western uh, empires. I'm speaking of, of course, uh, the British, uh, the French, uh, to a lesser, and the Dutch, of course, and uh, to a, a lesser degree, the, 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 uh, the Spanish, excuse me, the, the Italians. Uh, but in any case, so when, while the Western world was beginning to, it was under pressure to dismantle their empires and imperialism and empire became a dirty word after 1945. It's difficult for us to understand, but up until World War II, empire was something to be celebrated. Now, at least in the United States, those words carry a, a very negative uh, connotation. But as the Japanese are trying to build up their empire, the Western, empires were beginning to dismantle their empire. And of course, it was World War II that led to the implosion of most empires, even though there are many vestiges of European imperialism 
and colonialism after after the war. So um, I, I just wanted to uh, point that out because when historians look at Japan, good historians, I think, they always make that distinction between post-imperial Japan after 1945 and then imperial Japan from around 1868 to 1945. What happened before 1868, of course, is another, is another topic. Um, uh, but uh, in any case, so maybe I'll, um, uh, maybe I'll end there. And if anybody has any questions or comments, um, I'd uh, be happy oh. to uh, hear you. Wonderful. So what I want to do is uh, I want to ask you a few things uh, sure. because I'm I'm the proponent for all the audience. So I want to, I think you've done a great job of dispelling many myths of kind of getting rid of kind of commonly held misconceptions. But I want to get the discussion started at the second level of saying, what was your experience in Japan? Okay, so I wanna ask you a few questions about that and we'll have a conversation and then we'll go to breakout rooms where people will discuss whatever has been put, uh, put on the table and then we'll come back here and then we will do full, full range of um, uh, Q and A. So, uh, because what happens is that when a person is very, very familiar with something like you are with Japan, when people come to it with all these kind of misconceptions, it really, it really irritates you because it's like, you know, for you, it's like, this is what it is. And everybody around you is coming at it with all these very limited ideas. Okay. So I really appreciate kind of getting rid of those things. So I, I want to ask you at a, at a personal level. Mm -hmm. So what got you to Japan? Why, why did you go to Japan? Well, I, Actually, as an undergrad, I double majored in political science and Asian studies, and I wanted to study Chinese history or maybe Chinese politics, I don't know. But in any case, I had the opportunity to go to China, 1982-83, as an exchange student. And while I was there, uh, I realized that the type of research I wanted to do, but I wanted to do actually, um, I thought about doing a type of political anthropology, but it seemed very hard to do research at that time in China, because at that time, things, uh, chi China had just come out of the Cultural Revolution, and uh, things are still pretty iffy, actually. And so I decided, well, maybe I'll study another Asian society. And I, uh, there were some Japanese students at Beijing University that I got to know. And um, I didn't speak any Japanese at the time, but I said, you know what, I think when I what I'm going to do, I'm going to finish my year at Beijing University, and then I'm going to switch to studying Japan. And by then, my interest had changed a bit. I became interested in psychological anthropology. And so I went to Japan uh, as, a, as a grad student and started my dissertation research. And, wow. and then, then just to sort of finish that, uh, why, what happened with me in Japan. So I after I finished my dissertation, I was offered a job in Japan, and so I decided to stay, and I ended up teaching there for many years. So what were your, so both, so let's talk about both China and Japan first, and then we'll focus on Japan. So you got interested in Asian studies. Yes. Why? What, what interests you about Asian studies? Actually, originally, I was very much interested in Asian religions and philosophy. I used to read a lot of books, uh, even before I went to uh, university, on uh, Buddhism, Shintoism, uh, Hinduism, um, and, and in fact, I, I often thought of becoming a. Uh, I, I wanted to go into uh, comparative religious studies, mm -hmm. uh, so that was that really was my introduction um, into Asia. Okay, uh, one more, I'm just, this is all very fascinating. So um, what, what is different about this Eastern thought, about Eastern religion, Eastern philosophy? How did you see it at that point? What is it about Eastern philosophy that interested you? Um, I, uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly how to answer. I, I'm, I can't really, Pinpoint it to one thing. I, I, I guess I was just interested in ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. What is reality? And 
it seemed that in the Judeo-Christian tradition, of course, ultimate reality is put in theistic terms, that ultimate reality is defined as a personal God. And I guess what interested me about uh, Asian philosophy, not so much about Asian religion, because they also have a very strong theistic tradition too. But when I looked at Asian philosophy, I was interested in how they took a non-theistic, a non-personal view of what ultimate reality is. Uh, you know, so for example, Buddhism, at least philosophical Buddhism, mm -hmm. uh, th th there's not a lot of attention given to uh, what we would call the God, or mm -hmm. uh, of, of course, Buddhism as practice does have a lot of gods. Mm -hmm. You know, it's sort of it's sort of another myth that that mm -hmm. Buddhism that uh, that Buddhism is um, is not uh, theistic. That, that, but 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 the truth is actually there is a strong theistic component uh, to the way most people practice Buddhism. But I was attracted to the sort of more philosophical side of of Buddhism, and I found it fascinating that they just were not uh, interested in this idea of, of viewing uh, reality as uh, ultimate reality in personalistic terms. Um, so oh. that, that, that's basically that, that's, that's excellent. Um, now uh, let's go. Let's. I want to ask you one question about China years before going. So, what were your years in China like? What because you know you you've grown grown up in mostly in America, right? And yeah, then yes. you're going to China. You've spent three years there. What what yeah, was that, that oh, encounter yeah. with the culture like? Yeah, I spent one year in, in China. Oh, just one year. Okay, just one year um, as as an exchange student. Mm -hmm. And um, it was, um, well, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure where to begin because I, I actually really try to keep an open mind. I didn't know what to expect. And I told myself, whatever it is, it's going to be something very different from what, I, from what I'm used to. And mm -hmm. it was. And, uh, like I said, at that time, uh, people had, many Chinese talked about what had happened to them or their family members during the Cultural Revolution. Mm -hmm. Very sad stories. And so when I was in China, as sort of a naive American, everything was very politicized. Um, and uh, you had to be very careful with what you said. And there were some foreign students who actually were uh, had to leave the university because they thought it'd be funny. They wrote some political joke. Chalkboard. So the, the the atmosphere was very different. Okay. And I had a Chinese roommate. I requested a Chinese roommate to uh, help with my Chinese studies. And he was a very nice individual. But he told me he was there to keep an eye on me. Mm -hmm. And so it was a real, for me, it was a fascinating experience to see uh, how an authoritarian system works. Got it. Uh, okay, so let's let's move to Japan. What was Japan like? What were your first impressions? What what really uh, did you find interesting? Uh, what what did you find surprising when you reached Japan? Um, well, in the case of Japan, I probably was a little more prepared than China. Uh, I, I did a lot, a lot more reading on Japan before I went over. But I'll tell you what surprised me, and this relates to something that we were talking about before uh, today's podcast began. This idea of learning about a place from everyday uh, actions, for meeting people, talking to people, and seeing what is going on at the local level, for lack of a better expression. Because the images we get of any society is always going to be distorted to a degree. And there are different reasons for that. That's just the nature of media. It simplifies things. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you two or three uh, things that sound silly today, but at the time surprised me. Mm -hmm. So when I went to Japan, before I went to Japan, I was always told that Japanese, unlike Americans, do not drink coffee. They only drink tea. So if you don't like tea, you're going to have a problem. You better get used to it. And I was also told that in Japan, of course, they eat rice, unlike Americans who eat bread. So we can see this sort of, this, I, I, this, this binary, these binary identities being built up. Well, when I first went to Japan, one of the things, and again, it doesn't sound like a great profundity, sounds like a, a silly thing, but I was shocked at how much coffee 
Japanese drink and how they love coffee <laughs> and how on every corner in Japan, they have what they call uh, kisaten, these really wonderful little cozy coffee shops. And they had uh, vending machines that sold every type of coffee you can imagine. And of course they, they drink tea too. <laughs> but this idea that they don't drink coffee, I found shocking. And then the other thing, of course, was when it comes to uh, that they don't eat bread. Japanese eat a lot of bread. In fact, on every corner, it seems, they have uh, what they call panyasan, uh, uh, bakeries, where they would make the most delicious bread, better than you get in, in the United States. Uh, and, and then this was ubiquitous. And so the, the lesson here, those are two silly examples perhaps, but the, the lesson here is, it's common sense, I suppose, but if you wanna know about a place, you wanna learn about a place, you actually have to go there because you will not see the reality on CNN or just through a book. Um, uh, you, you really have to physically go to a place to learn about it. Yeah, uh, that, uh, absolutely. Um... The, I, I want to just quickly tell you about my experience with Japan. I have had two very interesting experiences. One is that when, you, when I was uh, living on the West Coast and I would travel to India, uh, there was no direct flights at that time. So I had to take a stop somewhere. And I found out that if I booked on Air India, they would put me up in, at the Narita airport for a whole evening for free. Hmm. And I did not have to get a visa or anything. I couldn't go to Tokyo, but I could go to the, there was a little town, Narita, where I could go to. So five times. So, so I, that was my standard thing. So that was my favorite thing about my India trip. I would always spend the evening in this little town of Narita. Um, and the thing that struck me was the visual sense like everything, like you could go to a very simple restaurant, not an expensive restaurant, and they will bring you a tray of food. And it would be a beautiful tray. It would have all these beautifully put together dishes, uh, you know, items. And each item had its own separate dish designed for it, which all fit on the tray beautifully. So it's just, just the, the, exquisite and that was kind of taken this wasn't this was a very inexpensive place so this was kind of that visual sophistication was just taken for granted in the culture that was there in in everywhere so that was one one thing that really struck me yes um that actually that struck me too in fact when i was living in japan i tried to write uh uh, a paper about visual culture in Japan. And I looked at a variety of things. Uh, I, I even looked at the Jap Japanese language, the grammar, how they express visuality. I submitted it to uh, a couple of academic journals and they all rejected it. And they said, you know, there's nothing special here. All places are concerned about visuality and everything else. And um, so I should really dig out that paper and see if it can be somehow revived because I think there is something there. Uh, and this relates to other topics you've talked about with different podcasts, this idea of the census and visuality. And, and then I think that's, I think you're right. I mean, there is something about Japan when they want to give information to you, they give it to you visually. And that really helps somebody if you're new to Japan and you don't know the language. Um, if something is diagrammed, if it's color coded, if it's displayed in a way that you can absorb the information quickly through your eyes, you're going to have a, a much better experience. And I can think of so many examples in Japan where they would do this. And just one quick example, the train stations. So when the train would arrive, they would have a, a, a sign telling you the name of the, the station. And then they would have an arrow saying, that station is this way, the next station is that way. But what struck me, what really made me feel good is that they would have multiple signs on the train platform. So no matter where you arrived, you would see a sign. You always knew where you were. And it's just, uh, th that's a whole other topic, uh, transportation, public transportation in Japan and spending time in New York City myself, I was wondering why can't we do <laughs> what the Japanese do? <laughs> 
Um, okay, uh, one other uh, quick story. Um, I, I talk to people whenever I travel. So I was at the New Delhi airport and I saw these two Japanese uh, kids. And I said, what are these guys doing here in New Delhi? So I asked them. So they said, oh, we had a vacation and we tried to come up with the most exotic place we could come to. So I, we came to New Delhi. So, so I said, oh, that's, that's quite courageous of you. Uh, how did it turn out? They said, oh, not too well, not too well. We, we fell sick on the first day we came here because we didn't know what not to do and stuff like that. But it turned out that, you know, like one of them was about to get into the government service. So he wanted to pick up English. So he said, I'm flying to this little town in Illinois. Okay. So I said, wait a minute, where are you from? You're, he says, I'm from Tokyo. So I, I quickly looked up the town because I was familiar with it. Do you realize that this town has 10,000 people? That's like less than people on your block. And he was, he was kind of aghast. So, so but he became a good friend. So he came here, did like, four, I think he was here for like two, three months studying English. And then he came here. I met him in New York. New York uh, was, you know, there's a lot of influx of young Japanese students into New York for the past, I would say about 10 years. So there is a little kind of Japan town east in East Village mm. with lots of restaurants and lots of kind of shops and stuff like that. So that's one advantage of being in New York is that you can be in touch with all the cultures uh, without, without having to leave town. So, <laughs> so wonderful. So let's do one thing. There is a lot of, there are a lot of questions. So instead of breakout rooms, um, let us first do the questions. So it's going to be, give me just a second. Uh, so folks, if you have questions, go ahead and type uh, exclamation mark. Uh, as always, the rules are type exclamation mark to speak. Number two, keep on topic. Number three, be brief. And number four, feel free to disagree with anything, but do so courteously. And at this point, because the topic is relatively new, uh, let's keep comments brief and mostly questions. Uh, so it's going to be Dave, Kevin, JJ, Judith, and David Edelson. Dave from Tacoma. Thanks, Shikhan. And, and Brian, I enjoyed your talk about Japan. My impression about Japan, I label quality. Uh, to me, that was a huge turnaround. Uh, growing up in the 50s, I think the Japanese theory was to sell low-cost goods in the United States. And quickly, they got the reputation of selling junk although there was some stuff that came from the city of USA. So it would say made in USA, which we read as, oh, made in USA, this is great. But then uh, there's a gentleman, I forget engineer scientist, Edwards Deming, who wanted to talk about continuous improvement and went to the, of course, the American companies, you know, GM and GM and said, oh, you're gonna tell us how to build cars? I don't think so, go shoo, shoo, go away, go away. So he went over to Japan and they realized they had this quality problem and they welcomed him and quickly turned around their quality and quickly Japanese had the reputation for the best uh, foreign cars and uh, I got to ride on the bullet train in 1970 go down to the World's Fair courtesy of the America uh, America sending me to Vietnam I get to R&R &R in Japan but uh, to me they really turned their reputation around in that field. Um. Yes, uh, I think you're right. There's an old movie, American movie from the 1950s, when uh, somebody calls uh, this guy and he doesn't want to talk to the, to the other person. And so he tells, he picks up an ashtray and he points to his friend and the friend knows what to say, which is, oh, he's in Japan. <laughs> and the idea is that the Japanese only made cheap ashtrays. But of course, now we know that's not true. And I think especially beginning in the 70s and 80s through 90s, uh, uh, the, the, the craftsmanship, the products um, are, are I, I actually usually a high quality. I only drive Japanese cars. Um, so, so, you know, I, I always want to be a little bit careful because I don't like to uh, characterize an entire society or civilization um, with anecdotes, but uh, I, I do have to share something personally. When I was in Japan, I, I can count on one hand how many times somebody made a mistake with an order at a restaurant or some paperwork. 
uh, just maybe four or five times the whole 16, 17 years I was there. When I came back to the United States in 2003, it seemed like everything I did was a problem with people. That there, there were people, credit card companies, uh, ordering something, uh, getting my order wrong, whatever it is. Uh, you know, maybe I'm being too hard on America, but it just seemed that it, mistakes are tolerated in the United States in a way that in Japan they're not tolerated. Um, and again, Japan does have its problems. You know, I, I want to be clear on that. There are a lot of negative things I could say about Japan. But what impressed me about Japan is the first thing you said, this idea of uh, paying attention to quality. Next up is uh, Kevin, JJ, Judith, uh, David, and Jean. Kevin. Thank you, Sanka, for bringing the topic. And uh, Brian, I, my question is related to uh, um, personality and culture perspective. Um, is here, for example, let's see, um, for uh, ethnically, like uh, J Japan value group, the priority over the individual. Uh, here, let's see, uh, also I believe it's uh, altruism versus like utilitarianism. That person, I feel Japanese people, they kind of put other people first then an individual myself or less, even later in heart, they, oh, I should be first. But because another personality, I, I got um, one, they say the 80% of Japanese, they don't speak, speak you directly what they want. So they just indirectly guess or hint, you know, that, you know, what you want. What's your thought about that personality, the culture perspective for Western and Eastern, for example, Japan? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Kevin. Uh, yeah, so there's two or three things there um, that I'll, I'll try to address. So that's actually, I, wanted, I should have mentioned that. That's another myth that the Japanese are group-oriented, where Westerners, usually they mean Americans, are individualistic. And it's actually much more complex than that, because when I lived in Japan, I saw a lot of individuality among the Japanese. And in, in the United States, all you have to do is watch the news. I see a lot of group, groupist behavior. And actually Americans are much more group oriented, I think, than the typical American might want to think. And why this discussion gets complicated is because we have to make a distinction between individuality and individualism as an Anglo-American economic philosophy. And while it's true that in the United States, uh, that political economic philosophy, individualism plays a big role, uh, that does not mean that you cannot find individuality uh, among the Japanese. And I, 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 I think that Japanese are actually very individualistic uh, from my experience. Um, to get back to what you said about direct, indirect, um, that's true that in typical spoken Japanese, there's a preference for being indirect. However, uh, we have to be a bit careful if we um, extrapolate from that idea because Americans can be very indirect when they need to be. <laughs> and that by the same token, Japanese can be very direct. And if you've worked for a Japanese, for a Jap Japanese boss or supervisor, there are many, many times when they can be just as direct as anybody from, for example, New York City, not to offend anybody from New York City. So again, it all depends on the context. It all depends on exactly what part of the culture we're talking about or what we're looking at. Uh, no offense taken, actually take, taken as a compliment, uh, Brian. Yes, uh, that's <laughs> good, <laughs> like that. Uh, uh, next up is going to be JJ. Uh, yeah, hi, thanks. Um, well, <clears throat> basically, um, what I wanted to say was that um, I uh, was wondering, you know, since we're talking about myths of Japan, um, what percentage do you think um, of this, uh, in terms of the myth, are, are created by outsiders and then what percentage created by insiders? Because I think a lot of times, you know, this myth 
are created through the perceptions that various people from outside Japan get, and then this whole narrative is built. And like, for example, the coffee, you know, um, <clears throat> it's true that we see in terms of uh, travel magazines or things that are of interest uh, would be the whole ceremony of the green tea because that's something very special and it's special to Japan. Um, and uh, so that's of interest. And then we think, oh, they love tea, they only drink tea, you know, but it's not something that Japanese necessarily are interested thanks, in. Uh, thanks, JJ. It is clear. The question is clear. It are What percentage of the myths are coming from outside and what percentage of myths are coming from inside? Right. Yeah. And then I just want to say one more thing, um, since you brought up the whole thing of visual um, and you write in a paper, you know, um, something that I, I thought in, in terms of that um, space and visual communication and things is that um, you were saying that in Japan, one of the myths is that, you know, it's kind of overpopulated or very crowded and small and things and, you know, but it's actually big and you know, but uh, when I lived in Tokyo, basically, I noticed that, yeah, in Tokyo, um, or in the large cities and, and economic with like economic elites and stuff, their their space is extremely valued, because it's expensive, it's, it's very crowded. And so to them, like one centimeter, you know, or like a, a, a part of an inch, um, every, every little, it's like space becomes so valuable that you want to make the most out of out of, out of like an inch, you know, and an inch in your apartment is like, uh, there's a lot you can do with an inch. And then you have to really organize space and then you have to maximize its use and so on and on. And that gets passed on to other things like a tray, you know, how, do, how are you going to organize? So you see a tray and you're like, wow, this is, this is, a, this is space. And this is like gold. And I'm going to like use, use it in the best that I can. That, you know, that was cool. Okay, so uh, to get back to your first question about to what what percentage of uh, of myths about Japan come from the outside or inside? I mean, <clears throat> I actually I, I can't answer that. I mean, all I can say is I think it's both, and I think what happens is they mutually reinforce each other uh, the, these different myths. Um, but it, but it's definitely it's definitely both be because. Japan, certain groups in Japan, especially the political economic elite, they have their own agenda for pushing myths. And then people outside Japan, for whatever reason, they have their own idea of why they think Japanese should be a certain way. Um, to get back to what you said about space. So uh, in, J in Japan, we have to really d distinguish between the urban and rural areas. And of course, not surprisingly, out in the rural areas, uh, space, real estate is not going to be that as expensive. Uh, Japanese cities are known for being very uh, expensive uh, because of rent, but that's because of a political decision not to build tall buildings. And what happens is when you don't build up, space becomes, in, in an urban area, becomes very expensive. And so, you know, I'm, that's a whole nother political economic discussion. Why is that the case? Why do the authorities not want Japanese to have more space? <laughs> There's all types of conspiracy theories about that. But if you go to Tokyo, at least last time I was there, and you go, there are some tall buildings, of course, you go to a very tall building. When you look out on Tokyo, it's amazing. It goes on for miles and miles, and it's basically flat. And so what I'm saying is there's no reason why space or rent has to be so expensive uh, in J Japan. I, I, I mean, you know, rent is always going to be expensive in an urban area, but especially in a city where the authorities do not allow you to build taller buildings. Thank you. Next up is uh, Judith. Go ahead, Judith. Um, just talking about visual culture, I just wanted to say that there is a Japanese garden in Portland, Oregon um, that I went to and actually the only Japanese garden I've ever been to, but it was the most beautiful garden um, that it took into account the lighting through the trees from every perspective. It was just amazing. Um, so I hope that that's not a myth. I hope that's, you know, that that's something that we can say is kind of real and, and something they bring uniquely. Um, my question 
Oh, and one other just quick thing. Um, the first novel ever written apparently was written by a woman in Japan in the early 11th century, Murasaki Shik Shikibu. I just, that's interesting. But my question is about your, um, the university system, because you talked about um, mistakes being more tolerated here. You talked about individualistic, and I was just mapping it on to trying to think you've written two books. And like, if you could just share a couple of the insights of what kind of like major conclusions you might have come to from what is good or bad about the systems uh, as a takeaway? Yes, so um, yeah, th so th there's a lot I could say, but I think um, a, a couple of things. People always ask, well, if their higher education system is so bad, how come the economy is so strong? But you could say the same thing about the United States. If we have such a bad, especially a high school system all over the country, why do we have one of the world's best economies? So there's something, there's, there's, it's more complicated than uh, making a direct link between education and the economy. There are a lot of other things going on. And in the case of Japan, though, from what I saw, uh, they do well economically because the companies do a lot of their training. They don't expect, at least when I was there, maybe things have changed, but when I was there, companies did not expect university graduates to be well-trained in anything. And from what I saw many times they weren't, except for maybe a few of the elite schools. Uh, I mean, there are some very well-known prestigious Japanese universities, but most of them um, by American standards, uh, I don't think are too, too good. Um, the second thing I could say, as I said, there are many things I could say, but the second thing, the lesson to be learned from Japan, I think, and you see this in other countries, not just Japan, but especially countries that try to modernize very quickly. Because remember, most, as I said earlier, there are two basic types of countries, countries that modernized and were successful and other countries that modernized and did not do well at all. And when you try to modernize too fast, you're going to have problems. And that explains some issues in Japan, I think specifically with the Japanese higher education system. So the Japanese higher education system, system the way it's organized, it's not that different from other places. But you have a ministry, it used to be called the Ministry of Education, which basically, to my, my, my experience, had too much power over the national and even in the private universities. And they were really hampering um, creativity and uh, hampering experimentation at, at universities. And again, I haven't looked in, I haven't really looked at Japanese higher education in the past uh, 10 years or so. So may, I don't think things have improved. And basically, if I was, go, if I was gonna blame somebody, <laughs> I would blame the Japanese central government for not loosening their reign over uh, their, the, the universities. It's just too much control. Thank you. Next up is going to be David. David, go ahead. Yes. And thanks very much, Brian, for this very interesting insights about Japan. Uh, I mean, one of the first things I wanted to sort of understand more about the, the background is you never mentioned exactly where you were in Japan, or maybe I missed it. I mean, where were you living and where did you visit? Because, I mean, to, to talk a little bit, I mean, or to, to give you sort of a space, you know, I think people have this assumption about Japan because most of our knowledge about Japan is the Tokyo area. Yeah. And the, the, the culture of Tokyo and the weather of Tokyo and people have rather limited knowledge about, you know, the Northern Islands, the Southern Islands, not just that it is this very large, I mean, we're talking about, but that the culture and the differences and economically and, and the, the language from everything, I mean, other than alcohol from Sapporo, people don't know about Sapporo and, you know, all the snow up there or about Osaka or about Fuoka. I mean, there's you know, a lot of diversity in that, but I don't think that most of that gets transmitted at least to the US, I don't know about other parts. I mean, I think more parts of Asia would might not know about more the, the distinctions and subtlety. So I was wondering where exactly in, in Japan you were, but I mean, both were living for your own experience and where you visited to get sort of a broader knowledge. Yes. Um, so that, that's actually a very good uh, question. And that, because that relates to this idea of diversity in Japan. And 
one piece of advice I would give to anybody who really was interested in Japan, they wanted to get to know Japan, is of course, visit the big well-known cities, uh, Tokyo, Yokohama, Osaka, but go to, um, go to, uh, go, go, go to the countryside, <laughs> because it is very, very different. Um, go to um, uh, places like uh, Nagoya, uh, Hi Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Fukuoka, Yamagata, Kumamoto. There's a, a, there's a whole long list of really nice regional places that um, you'll get a very different picture of what, what, what life is like in Japan. You know, you, so yes, visit the big cities, but please visit the rural areas and regional city, cities. From my own experience, I lived in Yokohama for a year. I lived in Nagoya for a couple of years, and but most of my time was spent in Tokyo. Next up is going to be Jean, Madeline, and Laura. Jean? Yeah, it's quite interesting. So um, I think uh, in Asian culture, Japan has most influence in the Western world. Uh, for example, in America, people know Asian mostly from Japan. We saw a lot of Japanese influence. What I found interesting is uh, because China have a lot of similarity between Chinese culture and Japan. And uh, in Tang Dynasty, actually, they bring the Chinese culture, Tang Dynasty, to Japan. Japan. That's why they get all this culture. Their traditional culture is part of Tang Dynasty, preserved. The interesting, the detail oriented how Japanese are, and they make everything into so detailed and into an art. And I've, I, one time I studied, I've no, I found the blood type of most Japanese, a type A, very similar to German. German also very famous for their quality of detailed, quality of their product. So I, I actually wonder if that part of the reason Japanese culture, and there are a lot of similarity between German and Japanese in many aspects. And they both defeated in World War II, you know, so did horrible, horrible things too. Besides they, but they also call very famous for quality of their product. And the Chinese blood type majority are type B. I wonder if that's play part of the, and Chinese are not very good with detail, you know, not as good as Japanese in many ways. I wonder if you have some thought on that. Okay. Um... So I, I, I can't really say much about blood type. I don't, I, 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 as, as a cultural anthropologist, I'd be doubtful whether uh, blood type plays a role, um, but you're right about the role, the, the big, very big role that China played in forming Japan. You know, Japan used to be called a, a moonlight civilization. So you had Korea, uh, parts of Southeast Asia, like Vietnam and Japan that sort of uh, absorbed uh, the, the radiant light from uh, the Sinosphere from, from China. But I think we also have to keep in mind how radically uh, Japan changed by the time you get into the 1800s after the Meiji Restoration, when they went on this crash course of modernization. And of course, in the case of China, their modernization took a bit longer and uh, it, was, it was just as bloody. Um, so to get back to this idea of Chinese influence. Many, most people, when they think of Chinese influence on Japan, they think of the language. And yes, that's true. But if you write out a Japanese sentence and you compare it and translate it into Chinese and compare those two sentences, they look very, very different. And so actually, uh, even the written language is um, uh, Chinese and Japanese is, is quite different. And of course, the, the roots, J J J Japanese uh, the, the syntax and the grammar are, are unrelated to, um, uh, to, uh, to Chinese. Um, and to get back to that comparison you made between Germany and Japan, they were both defeated in World War II. I think one interesting uh, trait that they share, you know, historians who studied World War II always used to put Italy, Germany, and Japan in, in the same basket and say what led to World War II, of course, is that these countries modernized too quickly, um, and, and that something broke? And you know, you know, what, what does that mean exactly? That's a whole other discussion. But there is something there, I think, and it does seem that, uh, as I said, the Japanese, when they were modernizing, 
they did not just absorb foreign powers from the Americans, the French, the British, uh, the, the Germans. They were very selective. They rejected certain things that they did not like about British democracy. They rejected certain things about American democracy, certain things about the, the French uh, educational system that was very centralized. They liked certain things about German politics. They liked certain things about German science, especially German science they absorbed. So what I'm saying is the Japanese, uh, we have to view them in that period of history as being very selective. They were not passive absor absorbers of foreign influences. Um, they were very, very careful in what, what, they, uh, what they brought on board in their project to modernize. Uh, next up is going to be Madeline, Laura, and David, and then we'll do breakout rooms. Madeline. Uh, Madeline, are you there? Can't hear. Sorry, uh, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, thank you, Brian. I have a question about the Japanese language. It was something that had been someone had mentioned in one of your other groups and never got picked up upon. That there, what this person said was that among the aristocracy, historically, there was a form of speech in which people said they were playing at things. I'm playing at doing this. I'm playing at walking. I'm playing at being dead. Uh, or he's playing at being dead. I looked around for it online. I couldn't really find it as a separate dialect. Mm. All I could find were a few references to phrases that mean playing at. And I was wondering, did this really exist? And if so, was it only the aristocracy? And what does it say about the Japanese views of role-playing and role-playing nature in the urban areas and all that sort of thing? So actually, I have to tell you, um, that's the first time I've heard about this idea, that, that, that expression of playing at. Um, I'll ha I'm curious, I'll have to look into it myself. I, I, won't, I, I wouldn't be surprised be, uh, if there was something like that. Uh, I mean, for one thing, of course, not just in Japan, but typically in most places, when you, where you, if you have a nobility or aristocratic uh, stratum, the language is going to be very uh, different. Um, but what I will uh, respond to is something that you mentioned, this idea of role playing. And that is something that really struck me uh, when I lived in Japan. In fact, uh, a lot of my writing and research on Japan has this theme of what we might call the staginess of social life, how so social life is a stage. And there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing uniquely Japanese about it, but I noticed many examples in Japan where playing a role is central to your social identity, where Americans like to think that role playing is fakery you're being inauthentic, you're not expressing your real thoughts, but in a society like Japan and other societies too, role-playing is considered what a mature adult does. And you have to be aware of what your role is and you have to be aware what is the proper language, what is the proper behavior, what are the proper skills I need to know to play that role. So as I said, this idea of role-playing in Japan, I think is, um, it's, it's something that's been uh, a, a theme in the, the way I look at, not just Japan, but how I look at people in general. Wonderful. Next up is going to be Laura. Laura, what's your question? Okay. Um, this goes back a, a number of years, um, and it's a general question. Um, I, um, we offered to host a Japanese student um, who claimed she wanted to learn how to deal with pre, um, preschool children. And she came to our home. She didn't interact with us at all. And, um, but in a very short span of time, uh, I found her to not work well with my daughter at all. She was hitting her. She allowed her to climb out onto the roof. Um, uh, over, we had a, a part of our home that had a rooftop that, um, and she let her climb over there. The people at the daycare were, said that she was very mean to my daughter. And 
obviously I couldn't sustain those behaviors, so I had to let her go. And her behavior in the next family was also really not um, acceptable. And it turned out she had no interest in preschool. She just wanted to come to the United States. She wanted to get out of her home because she wanted to have fun. She used this as a mechanism to become defiant because she could not stand to live by her family's rules anymore. She wanted to go out like teenagers and have fun like American teenagers. And I was wondering if that, if David found that to be uh, that that young people were suffering because there was a stronghold that the parents had um, on their lives, such that they want they were becoming defiant. And if you notice that, it became a cultural thing of defiance among the young Japanese. Well, um, I, I, of course, I can't speak for uh, all uh, Japanese youth. I mean, I will say that uh, in the context of higher education, what I saw in Japan is that many Japanese viewed their four years of uh, university education as a joke, as something to not be taken seriously. Um, that does not apply, of course, to all students. It doesn't apply to uh, the, the small number of uh, prestigious universities in Japan, but it does apply to, I think, a fair number of Japanese uh, students. Um, and that relates to the exam system. So the idea is once you pass an exam and you get to university, you don't have to worry about anything. You're going to get a job. Um, but, you know, saying that, I want to be very careful. <laughs> I don't want to... Uh, um, you know, paint with too large uh, a paintbrush uh, Japanese youth uh, because, uh, of course, uh, we, you know, we, we just, we, we have to be careful. But, but, I, but I have written a lot. I was a critic of the Japanese higher education system. I think there were some political, serious political problems there that maybe some other time we could talk about. Next up is going to be David. Yeah, hi, Brian, again. I wanted to allow other people a chance to, to ask some more questions. Um, uh, add some more, you know, get, get your opinion or, or comments about some other aspects that, that I have at, at least noticed of, um, for instance, I mean, again, you can generalize, but about, you know, Japanese being very hierarchical, being somewhat insular about um, yes, meaning I understand and not I agree. Um, I mean, some of these sort of unique aspects, I'm just wondering if you had any thoughts on those. Well, I think that, so some of the things you mentioned, this idea of Japanese being very insular, um, you, you know, there, there's that actually, that, that idea goes back to the Tokugawa period in the 1600s, this idea of what was called a sakoku, a closed country. And the idea is that foreigners were not allowed to enter Japan. And that was really a political decision because at that time, the, 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 the shogun, the military, uh, uh, leader uh, was was threatened by foreign influence, um, and so you know the the question I think we should be asking is to what degree is that is that still true today in Japan, and in many ways Japan is very globalized, it's very internationalized. Um, in some ways, it is not, but it really depends on what you what you look at, what specific domain of everyday life that you look at. So. Uh, when I came back to this country, uh, I saw things that, you know, I was embarrassed as an American. Um, but then in other ways, I saw Americans being very open-minded, being uh, in certain ways, not as insular as, for example, the Japanese. But the point is, it really depends on what specific thing you're looking at. And this goes back to something that we mentioned a couple of times in this podcast, the importance of going to a place walking around in a place, at least for a few weeks, seeing the people, talking to individuals, um, and you get a very different idea. Um, and and, and you know, this idea of hierarchy and groupism, for example, hierarchy plays a big role in Japan, but it plays a very big role in American culture too. And it plays a much bigger role in American culture than I think Americans believe. It's just that we don't use that language. So uh, that's true in all societies right? All these processes exist, groupism, individualism, individuality, being insular, whatever, uh, how open or not open are we to outside influences? 
But unless we label them and have names for these processes, we ignore them. They, they, don't, they don't rise to the level of, uh, of awareness. And uh, as I said, I think in the American context, a good example of that is groupism. I find Americans very group oriented, just as group oriented as Japanese. It's just that we don't talk about it as much. Right, uh, folks, so it's time for breakout rooms. Uh, give me just a second, make sure everything is good. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, um, well, what I had been going to ask before the breakout room, we ended up discussing in the breakout room. Okay, so we can which, skip if you want. Uh, no, it was, um, it was something Brian hadn't covered in his main talk, which is the aesthetic of cuteness in Japan <laughs> and what the ramifications are. And I thought it might be very interesting if Brian would share some of the things, his thoughts on it and the things we discussed. Sure. Brian? Um, so I was, uh, I was quite excited when Madeline asked me about cuteness because that, <laughs> for two reasons. One, that was one of the first things that struck me when I went to Japan and I saw cuteness everywhere. And I actually, uh, the second thing I wanna say, I've, I've written a fair amount about cuteness but when I started to research cuteness, uh, my colleagues, other academics, I think looked down on me and thought I was crazy, you know, because it's not a serious subject. But I had an intuition that if something is popular and if it's everywhere, it must tell us something about that culture. And so I pursued some projects uh, on um, cuteness. And so in any case, in the breakout section, we, we were talking about that. And one point I made is that cuteness in Japan uh, is so important that they actually have sub-genres, different types of cuteness. You know, we were talking about erotic cuteness. Um, and uh, off the top of my head, I can't think of other types of, of cuteness now. But, you know, the question is, why is cuteness so important in Japan? And uh, I, I have two reasons that I gave. The first reason is because uh, formality is so important in Japan. Uh, strictness, the hierarchy, are, are really emphasized in Japan. So they need to soften human relations and they do that through cuteness. That's why you'll see Japanese, the police using cute images. You'll see big Japanese corporations using cute logos uh, to soften their image. The other point, I think cuteness compared to the United States, I don't wanna speak for other places, but in America, when we meet somebody for the first time, the idea is to get rid of hierarchy, to get rid of formality, to be casual, to be relaxed, to be open. In Japan, they don't do that. Um, so in Japan, instead of being casual out in public, they communicate through cuteness, we, we might say. So cuteness plays the role that casualness does in uh, American society. Fascinating, fascinating. Folks, uh, if you have comments or questions, you can go ahead and type exclamation mark in chat. Uh, Jean, you're next. Yeah, I want to ask you about uh, this uh, modernization versus tradition. I think Japan actually did a great job combining. They maintain the tradition culture and same time modernize technology. They are very advanced in the computer and uh, you know, their animation become like I think their animation become the world culture. All my kids want to go to Japan because they watch the Japanese anime. <laughs> so, and I have a friend whose daughter in China learned Japanese just by watching the anime. And she want to go there to study in college for college. So I think they have, so I'm trying to understand. So they have this hierarchy, which is not a democratic system. At the same time, they have most advanced technology and they're very developed in um, robot, robotic. You know, I think they're, so I just wonder, you know, the, it seems to they be able to con, uh, resolve the conflict between the tradition and new modern technology without, they can adapt the modern technology without change their mindset some way. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder what you think on that. Yes, so that's something that's often said about Japan that they were able to balance tradition with, uh, with modernization, I, I think, to some degree, I think that's a fair statement. Um, but sometimes we have to be a little bit careful because what I've noticed is so-called Japanese traditions 
are not actually that traditional. They don't go back very far in Japanese history when you trace them, or they had a very different development than people assume. Um, I can't think of any examples off the top of my head now, but, but uh, and also this idea of modernization. Of course, there are different types of uh, modernization. We, we're talking about technology. We're talking about political life. Um, we're talking about economics. Uh, so some societies are able to perhaps modernize in some areas, but not all areas. And, uh, but Japan, I think, is a place that pretty much was able to modernize in all areas. It was a very bloody, very violent modernization. Um, but they, they were, after 1945, of course, they, they were welcomed into the community of democratic uh, and economically su successful nations. So something important to keep in mind about Japan, why they were able to balance tradition with modernity. Um, they were never colonized. I mean, you know, you could say, well, the Americans occupied Japan for seven years after, after, after the, their defeat in the war. But other than that, unlike some other countries, they, they, they never had to fight off um, foreign invaders the way that, for example, uh, Korea has, or China, or India, uh, many other countries. Most countries at some time, the past 500 years, have had to put up with attempts to colonize them. Japan, in a way, there are a few other countries like Japan, but Japan is one of these countries, not to use the word too glibly, but lucked out. It, it, it never was uh, uh, colonized by foreign power. Let me ask a follow-up question. I mean, one of the things that has always puzzled me about Japan is the speed of change. You know, it has been kind of open to the world and then close to the world and open to the world again. And the rapidity with which the whole people take that up is quite stunning to me. You know, places like America or places like India doesn't, you know, things move far more gradually. Whereas this, it seems to, you know, think social change can happen very fast yes. in Japan. Is, is, is my impression correct? And what is the reason for that? Um, yes, you, your impression is right on. In fact, that's something I wanted to mention because that's a, that what you just brought up ties together a lot of different themes we've been talking about. Japan, so there's this idea that, that things don't change in Japan because it's traditional and their culture. But the truth of the matter is Japan changes very fast. And that, and it started to change very fast with the Meiji Restoration in 1868. And ever since then, Japan has been like a, uh, like a train going down tracks very, very fast. And a few times it's crashed, like when it tried to build an empire. Um, but when you look at how quickly Japan had to rebuild itself, for example, after 1945, it really was a miracle. Uh, it, it is very impressive. And throughout the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and 90s, of course, Japan had a change in major ways that often people forget unless you pay close attention to Japanese uh, history. In fact, this, I think there's almost, uh, you asked why have Japanese been able to do this? I mean, I think there are many reasons. Part of it has to do with this geographical location that was never colonized, but uh, I think there's an ideology in Japan and I gave a name to it. I wrote a book about Japanese nationalism about 20 years ago because I wanted to answer this question. And I, the name I gave to it is renovationism. And renovationism is what happens when you have a very powerful uh, civilization that's been around for a long time, but they have to confront modernity. And some countries do it better than others. And if they do it well, it's because they know how to renovate. And renovate is this idea of accepting change. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I wrote a whole book about it. So it gets, you know, I, I, I can't think of the, uh, there, there's, there's actually several steps to how renovation works. But, it, but it's just to kind of, in a very simple way, uh, answer your question. There is an ideology in Japan that I try to give a name to. Sure. Um, let's do one thing, uh, Brian. This is just incredibly fascinating. So we'll, let's do a follow up on this uh, next uh, next uh, Saturday, and we'll figure out what because there are several things that have come up. One is this, you know, renovationism. 
Second is your observations about the visual, um, you know, excellence in Japan. And third is your observation on cuteness. Maybe we can cover all these three or some other combination of topics. I know you have many, many, many Japanese topics because it will regard today as an introduction to clear out all the, all the stuff, which is all the myths and stuff and misunderstandings. And then the next time we'll hit some major themes and we'll figure out the details of the theme. Uh, I'm going to give priority to people who have not asked the questions before. So it's going to be Linda, Dave, and Kevin. Linda. Brian, what role does religion play in the life of most Japanese? Um, so I'm glad that's another question I'm glad you asked because that's something I spent a lot of time thinking about. When I went, when I first went to Japan, my dissertation was on Japanese religion. And this is, there's kind of a, uh, I think uh, a myth or misunderstanding about Japanese religion. Um, from, from the American perspective, we always ask, well, are they Buddhist or Shintoist? But uh, the, the truth of the matter is many Japanese are both. <laughs> or we might say many Japanese are actually quite secular minded. I mean, I think they're, I, I don't like to generalize, I think they're probably more secular minded than Americans. And th th there are many things, many examples I could give. But, you know, in Japan, if when you go to a funeral, it's going to be a Buddhist funeral. But when you go to ceremonies for your small children, it's going to be Shintoist. So the same person partakes of different religions. And then something else I should add, and this is something that many people uh, who don't study Japan are unaware of, but Japanese who want to become spiritual, if they're really interested in religion, they join what are called one of the new religions in Japan. And many people outside Japan have not heard of them, but I, I did my dissertation on one of them. That is where the action is in Japan, these what are called new religions. There's maybe three, four or 500 of them. Some are very big, some are very small. Some actually are very well known like Soka Gakkai is a new religion. And so, you know, that's something perhaps another time I could talk about, but uh, th these new religions, most of, many of them came on the scene either right after World War II or during the 1920s or 30s or in the late 19th century. And so, as I said, if you want to know where Japanese, Japanese, modern Japan is in terms of spirituality, look at what are called the new religions. Would I be correct in guessing that most Japanese would not be attending some kind of religious service in a religious structure once a week? Um, it, it, it's hard for me to answer that. I, I mean, I think some do, some do, some do go to the uh, Buddhist temple or on a regular basis, or some give offerings at a Shinto shrine. Uh, some do. It's not unusual. When you go to Japan, of course, you'll see uh, shrines and temples uh, all over the place. Wonderful. Um, I just wanted to remind you that a wonderful Japanese American philosopher was here a couple of weeks ago. I'll put the link in. We had an amazing conversation, uh, Yasuhiko uh, Kimura, and he's going to be back next Saturday as well at five o'clock. And we're going to be talking about inner freedom and outer freedom. His, one, of his, one of the interesting points he made is that in the East, inner freedom is what they focus on and they can actually accept a lot of restrictions outside. And he loves, and he, he, he loves that inner freedom. And then when he came to America, he fell in love with founding fathers and how they managed to actually achieve outer freedom. And he talks about the combination of uh, both of them. So uh, that's going to be at 5 p.m. Uh, tomorrow, or 5 p.m. on next Saturday. So 12 p.m. will be uh, Brian's follow-up on Japan, and then we'll have uh, Yasuhiko at five o'clock. Next up is going to be Dave, followed by Kevin. Folks, keep your questions short. We are running out of time. Dave. A couple quick impressions. One, downtown Tokyo in 1970 was spotless. Of course, there were policemen on every corner, but I couldn't believe it. We're such terrible litterers. The next thing is the pachinko parlors and the pachinko machines on the corners, 10 or 15 men sitting there all day long or for hours, and these vertical pinball machines going, psh, 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 just terrible racket. And the other thing I mentioned that came to me is the movies, The Seven Samurai, that Kurosawa's 
famous, famous, made great movies. We, we have attained with Magnificent Seven. But thanks, thanks again. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I, actually, just a quick comment to what Dave said about these uh, pachinko parlors. Uh, so when I was there, they were all over the place. They're very hard to miss. They're very loud. They're very colorful. And that's where Japanese go if they want to gamble. Gambling is illegal in Japan, but there's a way to get around it by going to these, uh, these pinball parlors. And pin, these pachinko parlors, this is a really good example of what, what type of aesthetic most Japanese see on a daily basis. So when we think of Japanese aesthetics, we think of you know, flower arrangement and uh, some famous uh, novel, uh, a calligraphy, uh, fine arts, but most Japanese are on a daily basis exposed to a more pop, a harsher, a louder, more colorful type of uh, aesthetic. And the pachinko parlors are a good example of that, as are manga, of course, in this idea of cuteness. Next up is uh, Kevin. Yes, thank you. I, I got a question about the related decision maker as a nation. Like in the 7th to 9th century, they, uh, Japan adopted the Tang dynasty. They did language, culture, doing well. They reno renovated well, use that term. Then in the 19th century, they're doing well on the uh, Western lines, the industry revolution. I, my decision by, uh, question about the decision on a World War One, World War One, World War Two. Why that decision is uh, is arbitrary, long or correct? Why they lost the war? If let's say the win war of the world will be different. Thank you, Brian. So, uh, Kevin, I was a little, I I didn't quite catch the the, the actual question. Yeah, what are your thought about their decision as a nation? They said, let's see, like as Yank said, we, they're going to renovate and learn together, they're going to do it, then close door again. Why do World War II doesn't work? They lost the war. They almost lost control of country to the US and uh, an ally. Right. So uh, you're asking why they lost the war? Yeah, why, why they make their own decision? Mostly they, they're doing correct. Uh, national, they renovate, close door is good. They renovate, like they learn the uh, Chinese uh, talk culture. Right. Then uh, Western uh, culture, they do, you know, industry revolution, car industry, uh, IT industry. However, they didn't make up on a World War II. Any thought about that? Um, well, I, 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 I think I understand your question, why, why they lost the war. Um, there are many reasons why they lost the war. I mean, for, for one thing, in, in terms, I think the main reason in, in terms of industrialization, they just simply could not keep up with uh, the Americans um, in, in terms of producing uh, manufacturing uh, weapons. And of course, they had not just the Americans, they were also fighting against the, uh, the Chinese and, and the British and, and the French. So, um, you know, many Japanese after the war uh, realized that it was a, a bad idea to try and uh, take on all the other great powers at that time. Wonderful. Um, all right, so this was uh, really fascinating, uh, Brian, and look forward to uh, doing a follow-up. So um, I have those ideas, those three ideas of, you know, the renovation idea, the visual, uh, expression idea and the cuteness idea but if you have other things that you would like to just send me an email and we will finalize something and we will do it next saturday on a follow-up i i thought this this worked out really well and it's very clear that you know you're kind of immersed yourself in japan and japanese culture and what happens is that i think more of us need to do that i mean i'm in new york because i like to do that I actually talk to people um and it's it's very surprising actually you know, because, you know, you go to Chinatown here and after, when I went to Beijing, there wasn't that, there isn't that big a difference. I talk to people there, there I talk to people here, people who have just come in, they are pretty much, they bring their culture with, with them. So it's a great way of interacting. Um, and I think we need to make 
this kind of knowledge of world culture, especially the East and the West, mm -hmm. more natural part of our lives. Um, Yasuhiko, who is going to be talking uh, next Saturday, he spent, you know, he's from Japan. He grew up in Japan. He, at 16, he decided to become a Zen Buddhist monk. So he started training for that in India. So he spent three years in Bombay, a few blocks from where I lived. I probably ran into him at some point there when I was there. And then he came to America. So he has all these three cultures in him. And he's just recently translated uh, Yi Ching. Um, so he's, you know, both, uh, you know, uh, scholar of uh, Chinese uh, as well. So he has all these three pieces. And um, I would like to do more of this dialogue between these uh, cultures. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, Brian. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Um, folks, oh, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye now. So, bye. Uh, so the oh, next yeah. thing. Bye.